Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and if you want to catch my newest video, I post one every day. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Kraft Heinz's stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios. Kraft Heinz is a food company formed by the merger of Kraft Foods and Heinz. Its headquarters are in Chicago and Pittsburgh. Kraft Heinz is the third largest food and beverage company in North America and fifth largest in the world. Over 20 brands are part of the company's profile, including Boca Burger, Grey Poupon, Oscar Mayer, Philadelphia Cream Cheese, and Planters Peanuts, just to name a few. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 40 billion market cap. They're trading at $32 a share and they have 1.2 billion shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. The company has been growing its free cash flow over $1 billion a year. They're at their peak in a trailing 12 months at $3.9 billion. Net income is a profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And they had a big positive in 2017, then a big negative in 2018. Another positive in 2019, but a negative in a trailing 12 months. Revenue is pretty steady from $26 billion to $25 billion. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. And the difference between those two numbers is their gross profit. Below gross profit is operating expenses. Then below that is operating income. That was $5 billion in a trailing 12 months. Much lower than 2017 of almost $7 billion. Below that is other income and expenses. The reason they have negative net income in 2018 and the trailing 12 months was due to asset impairments. 15 billion in 2018 and 3 billion in a trailing 12 months. An asset impairment is when you reduce the value of an asset on a balance sheet and pass through the loss onto the income statement. This is a non-cash item, so it doesn't affect cash flow. It does affect net income though. You should really focus on operating income because the stuff below operating income can really skew net income. You'll see what I mean when we look at the statement of cash flows, how cash flows aren't affected by this. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generated from its operational business. And that's been growing quite a bit from half a billion to 4.4 billion. Then you have capital expenditures, which are investments in property, plant, and equipment. And the reason the company had negative free cash flow was they had their lowest operating cash flow and their highest capex, which resulted in negative 700 million of free cash flow. But in 2018, 19, and 20, they have lots of free cash flow to work with. A company uses its free cash flow to pay dividends, buy back stock, pay down debt, or invest back into the business. Each year, the company has been reducing their total debt. They issued 7.5 billion in 2017, but paid down 8.9 billion. In 2018, they also paid down more debt than they issued. Same thing in 2019 and a trailing 12 months. The most important part of any business is their operating cash flow. And this company has great operating cash flow, 4.4 billion in trailing 12 months. The way you calculate operating cash flow, you start with net income. That was negative 190 million. Then you have to add or subtract the non-cash items on the income statement. They pass through a $1 billion depreciation expense but we have to add that back on a statement of cash flows since that's a non-cash item. They also pass through a positive $740 million to defer taxes, so we have to minus that out on the CFO section. They pass through a $3.8 billion asset impairment. So even though the company reported negative net income, they actually generated $4.4 billion of operating cash flow. Because net income is not cash, it's accounting profit and loss. To understand how much cash the company generated, you need to look at the statement of cash flows. Let's look at a capital structure, 51 billion of equity, 29 billion of debt. They're 64% equity, 36% debt, and their WAC is 7.4%. And that's a discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 86 billion. 
we discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $76 billion. We divide that by 1.2 billion shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $63. They're trading at $32, so they're trading at a 40% discount. It's a strong buy according to the model. Simply Wall Street is even higher than me. They're at $75 a share. So the stock price has not done well the past few years. It looks like it peaked in the mid 80s, but has been coming down ever since. It seems to be priced at a really good value, but if the market doesn't recognize that, the stock price will never go up. The company did pay a 63 cent dividend, but it cut it in 2019 to 40 cents. It still pays a decent dividend at 4.86%. They probably cut the dividend to be more in line with the stock price. The company pays out 51% of its free cash flow. And the way you calculate that, it's annual dividend payment over free cash flow. And their beta is 1.01, so the stock moves with the market. The stock has gone up 5.5% in the past 52 weeks, worse than the S&P 500, which went up 14%. The low was $20, the high was $36. The stock is trading below its 50-day and 200-day moving average, so it seems to be on a downtrend. About 6 to 8 million shares are traded each day for this stock. Of the 1.2 billion shares outstanding, 674 million are on float. So a lot of shares are not available to investors. About 79% of the shares are held by institutions. 2.8% of the shares on float are shorted. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago and reinvested the dividends, you'd have $5,600 today. If you did not reinvest the dividends, you'd have $6,100 today. Not a good return on investment. Berkshire Hathaway is the biggest shareholder at 27%, then 3G Capital, then Vanguard, BlackRock, and State Street. Let's look at the financial ratios. The average PE in the market is 10.9, the median is 14.3. PE is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They have negative net income, so they have negative PE. Price of sales is stock price over sales per share. They are 1.6. That means investors are paying $1.60 for $1 revenue. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. They are 0.8. They have a really good price to book ratio. And the way you calculate book value per share, it's equity over shares outstanding. Equity is assets minus liabilities in the balance sheet. And they have 52 billion of equity, negative 33 billion of tangible equity because they have 84 billion of intangibles on their balance sheet. 35 billion of goodwill and 49 billion of other. Interest coverage ratio is EBIT over interest expense. They can cover their interest payments about three and a half times. ROE is net income over equity. They have negative net income, so negative ROE. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. They could just cover their current liabilities with their current assets. And their current assets are 2.3 billion of cash, 2.2 billion of receivables, and 2.7 billion of inventory. The company does seem to be well capitalized. They did have $3.9 billion of free cash flow in a trailing 12 months. They have a little bit of working capital. Working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. They also have a $2 billion dividend payment. So they have about $2.1 billion of funding according to my calculation. Assuming they have a similar free cash flow amount in 2021, they shouldn't need more debt to run their business over the next 12 months. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to similar companies, I've done videos on Beyond Meat, Conagra, General Mills, Hormel, Kellogg, Reynolds Wrap, Simply Good Foods, and Tupperware, all in the same industry as Kraft. And if Kraft has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in green, they're better than the average. So they're worse in PE because of that asset impairment. They're much better in price to sales and price to book. Current ratio is worse than average, but at least they're above one. They have a 0% ROE. They are lower in debt than the average company. They're a big company, 40 billion market cap, and they do pay a really good dividend, 4.9%. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 48% discount. Their stock price has come down so much in the past couple of years, it seems like a really good value. And I rank their free cash flows 8 out of 10 because they're growing so much and 3.9 billion is a good amount. I rank their revenue 6 out of 10, just because it hasn't really grown much, but 25 billion is a good number. The ratios are pretty good, even though they have some negatives in there, it's mainly due to that asset impairment. If you pull that out, they would have much better ratios. And I give their products a 7 out of 10, 
They have pretty quality products and they're fairly well known. And the company has pretty strong brand recognition. A lot of people, especially in North America, know about the brand. And I think overall, people think highly of their products. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.